The most essential classes in the Java Standard Library are included in a package called java.lang. Lang here is short for language. Because these classes are special and used so frequently, all of the stuff in java.lang is automatically imported, so you never need to explicitly import them. The most important class in java.lang is object. This is the class which is always at the top of the class hierarchy. Object has several methods defined in it, and so every class is going to inherit these methods, but we're not going to discuss these methods until later. Another important class in java.lang is the string class. Every string in Java is an instance of this class. So for example, if we have a string literal, such as here we have the string reading hello, and we wish to assign it to a variable, well we have to assign it to a string reference. The string class includes several dozen methods, including one called length, which returns the number of characters in the string as an int value. So when we invoke length on the string, it'll return 5, because that's the number of characters. The remaining string methods do various manipulations that you often want to do with strings. To give one example, the method to uppercase will return a string which has all the same characters, except any lowercase character gets converted to uppercase. Now be very clear that this method does not modify the existing string object, it produces a new one. In fact, none of the methods in string will ever modify a string object, they only produce new strings. So effectively in Java, strings are always immutable, they can't change. In addition to all the methods of string, the plus sign operator is defined to concatenate strings. When the operands to the plus sign are numbers, it of course performs addition, but when one or both of the operands are strings, then the plus sign will produce a new string, which is a concatenation of its two operands. So if we have this plus sign with two operands, a string reading hello, comma, space, and another string reading ron, then what this operation produces is a new string that combines them into one. In the next example, only one of the operands is a string, so the other operand gets converted to a string and then concatenated with the other and so the operation returns a single string in which they're joined together. So the class object and the class string are two important classes in the package java.lang. java.lang includes a few dozen others, some of which we'll discuss later. Every interface, every class, every field, and every method in Java has a visibility level. The visibility level of a thing determines where in the source code of a program it is allowed to be used. So for example, say we are writing code where the class cat is not visible. Well what that means is we can't write any code there that requires using the name of that class. So for example, we couldn't declare a reference variable of type cat because that would require using the class name cat. What the lack of visibility does not mean is that it's totally impossible in that place to handle objects of type cat. Say we invoke some method which returns a cat object. Well, what we can't do is assign the cat object to a cat reference because we can't create cat references, but a cat is a valid kind of object, so we can create a reference of type object and assign the cat to that reference. With fields and methods, it's the same idea. If, in a place where you're writing code, some field is not visible, then you can't refer to that field by name. This doesn't mean that there's a magic force field such that, in this location, we can't do anything that would possibly affect that field, or that would possibly get back its value. No, that's not what happens. Even if the field is not visible, it's possible, say, another method of its class will return the value of that field for us, or, say, will set the value of that field for us. So we can interact with the field indirectly. We just can't do anything that uses its name. So a key idea here is that this visibility restriction is enforced entirely by the compiler. Once your code is compiled and running, the language runtime has no concept of this visibility. Every time we declare a field or method, we give it one of four different access levels. These are called public, protected, default, and private. To declare a member to be either public, protected, or private, you precede it with one of these three reserved words. A field or method not preceded by one of these three words has default visibility. As for classes and interfaces, they can only be either public or default. They can't be protected or private. So every class and interface is going to have either public visibility or default visibility. 
The easiest to understand visibility level is public, because when something is public, it's visible everywhere. There's no restriction. In contrast, private visibility is the most restrictive. When a field or method is private, it's only visible within its own class. By far, public and private are the visibility levels you're going to use most often. 99% of the time, the only question to ask yourself is, should this be public or should it be private? And the general guideline is that if you can't think of a reason for something to be public, leave it private. In particular, fields generally should be private. Some even say that all fields should be private, because that's consistent with the principle of encapsulation. An object in object-oriented programming is meant to be like a module, where the interactions with the components of the object, the fields, are done through a limited set of methods. Occasionally, though, we know we don't want the member to be public, but private is too restrictive, and so we have default and protected. Something with default visibility is visible anywhere in the same package, and the same is true of protected members, except they are additionally visible in any subclass, whether it's in the same package or not. So, for example, if in the class cat we have a protected method named meow, then we can invoke meow anywhere in the same package, as well as in any subclass of cat, even those not in the same package. The thinking behind protected is that a descendant class has a special relationship with its ancestor, and therefore it may be reasonable for that descendant to see more of its ancestor's inner workings. In truth, members are very rarely made protected, and they're virtually never made default. In fact, it's arguable that there shouldn't be a default visibility level at all. The real reason for its inclusion in the language is that when giving small examples of code, or say when teaching the language, it's nice not always having to write public or protected or private because they're quite verbose. In all of my code examples so far, you haven't seen me use public, protected, or private because I didn't want to have to explain yet the concept of visibility. It's arguable that that's all that default visibility is really good for, keeping code examples clean and simple. The key thing to keep in mind about these visibility levels is that they exist solely to enforce the principle of encapsulation. In particular, when you're using code written by someone else, say someone else working in your team, or say code from a standard library, you shouldn't be using the things in those objects which are meant to be private. And so when such things are declared private, the compiler can stop us from misusing them. Be absolutely clear, though, that this visibility enforcement happens entirely at compile time. Visibility levels are entirely a compile time concept, and they have no effect whatsoever on how the program actually operates at runtime. So in fact, if you were to take any code written in Java and remove all visibility restriction, that is, if you were to make everything public, it would run exactly the same. As far as the operation of programs is concerned, visibility levels are totally superfluous.